Hi everyone, my name is Sylvia Gorajek and welcome to another episode of Valley Talks. Today I'm so happy to welcome Julia Cordray, co-founder and CEO of People, an app that allows you to recommend and be recommended by other people. People app has gained huge media attention in the fall of 2015 and just recently in March 2016, right after it's launched in the App Store. Julia, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Absolutely, thanks for having me. We're going to talk about all the crazy stuff that was happening around you and your company in a minute, but let's start from the beginning. And for those who are not familiar with people, can you please explain what's the goal of your uh, app and also how did the idea come about? Yeah, sure. So people allows you to safely manage your online reputation while making better decisions about the people around you. So think of your character as a new form of social currency. People's for anybody that wants to display their character to others. So this comes in handy for um, employers, employees, business owners, teachers, lawyers, doctors, anybody where their reputation is very, very important. And what's really great and unique about our app is you can actually share the recommendations that you receive on the app outside of the app onto your social media and you can share parts of your profile. So um, really exciting new online reputation management space. Um, the concept came about actually because my co-founder um, and best friend Nicole McCullough, she called me up in April of 2014 and she said, you know what, like I've got these two beautiful little girls, I'm in a transient townhouse complex in Southern California. I want to get to know my neighbors better. I want to get to know the parents that go on play dates with my children. I want to get to know the teachers, the childcare workers, you know, the doctors that take care of my kids. I just really want to be sure. And I thought, wow, like that's a really big problem to solve. And I'm sure there's a lot of other parents out there that are just as concerned as you are. And then on the flip side, she said, you know, I want a platform where I can give the Starbucks barista down the street a recommendation to boost her up because she's so good at her job and then maybe she could get an even better job if the right people see those recommendations. Mm -hmm. So you know that's how the concept started and she contacted me because she knew I could bring the concept forward, I can get it going and so I told her you know there should be an app for that. So that's how it started. And that's because you were also a um, recruiter. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So I own a recruiting company called Career Fox and she saw the parallel between how do I look people up when I'm ready to present them to my clients? You know, how do I really know this job seeker is really good at what they do? And so that's why she initially called me. She thought, Julia must have some secret way to find out information. And, you know, we do have our ways. We'll look you up on social media. And unfortunately, uh, for job seekers, we'll make snap judgments about you. Mm -hmm. So if you had something like the People app, you have a better way of protecting your online reputation. Um, so yeah, that's why she called me. She thought that maybe I had some, some great way to look people up that she didn't know about. So I want to talk to you about the beginnings, but even thinking before that, um, what was your life like? So you were born and raised in California. And, that's right. And you moved to Canada. Yeah, that's right. When did you move to Canada and why did you move um, there? I moved in 1993. I was 13. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's Canadian and my grandparents actually bought us a house in the Okanagan Valley, which is like the Napa Valley of Canada. So, you know, of course my mom was like, we're going for sure. And my mom just wanted a, a really great place to raise my twin brother and I. And I'm really glad that, that I got to grow up in both countries. And mm -hmm. so I'm happy to be a dual citizen. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a great, it's been a great experience. So when you decided to go for people, to build this company, to build this app, what were your first steps? <laughs> so I told Nicole I had two conditions. I would build this company with her just as long as my lawyer felt it was a safe idea and just as long as my uh, friend um, who owns an international app development company called Robots and Pencils, just as long as Michael Sikorsky liked it, I felt safe that you know we should maybe pursue it. And it turned out to be such a great result because not only did my lawyer love the concept, he was our very first shareholder. He was super excited about it. Mm -hmm. He told us, you know, this completely safe concept. And then um, Michael Sikorsky from Robots and Pencils 
literally loved the idea and and was really generous in offering us a, a friends and family discount if we built it with his firm. Um, we didn't actually go with robots and pencils, but once I saw these two capable, confident, competent men say big thumbs up, I was like, okay, it's go time. We should definitely do this. So that was the next step. So I had those meetings within two weeks mm -hmm. and then contacted Nicole back and said, I'm all in, like, let's do this. When was it? Um, so this was April of 2014. So I had these meetings within mm -hmm. two weeks in the first two weeks of April. So right after Nicole called me. Before you launched People, you raised almost $500,000 and that was all from private investors. Um, who were you actually raising this money from? So we have about 29 shareholders. Yes. Yeah, and, and they're all Canadian. And how, how did you learn how to actually get started with this, with pitching <laughs> your idea, you know, yeah, preparing sure. the pitch deck and everything, all the startup things? Well, thank God I'm a salesperson at heart because I, I sincerely had no idea how to raise money. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what, what makes a good pitch deck. It, it was all kind of intuitive. It was like, okay, I gotta learn from as many people as possible, but I also have to trust my intuition. So, you know, the amount of learning that it took to even get to the point of pitching people. Mm -hmm. I remember my first couple of pitch meetings, I didn't even bring the pitch deck because I was shy and a little nervous about it. I would just verbally tell them about the concept. And those pitches didn't lead anywhere. And until I actually started sitting people down, being super clear with them. Do you have $10,000, 45 minutes to spend with me? Will you sign an NDA? And will you give up that $10,000 within a week? If you have all of those criteria, I'll sit down with you and I'll tell you about people. Now, all the investors that I met with one-on-one -on -one had no idea what the concept was gonna be. So they just showed up to the meeting, trusting the process, trusting that I was onto something knowing that I had successfully built another company. Mm -hmm. So it took, a, it took a bit of trust. And um, I doubt they even thought they were gonna part with their money, but I didn't actually hear no. Everybody was like, yes, 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 yes. And it just kind of snowballed. And I think that's pretty rare in the I think money so. raising area. You know, it was, it, was, it was humbling and exciting. And, mm -hmm. and I think they saw what I saw and, and they trust me. And I think those two elements led to people just handing us mm -hmm. investment money. And how about the team? You had to find developers to build the app. <laughs> yeah, so we actually interviewed uh, three app agencies. So we knew that we didn't want to bring people in-house and try and manage a, a tech team because we didn't have that experience. So I decided, you know, we need to interview at least three agencies. Two were from Calgary. One was that Robots and Pencils, and then there was another one. And then the third one was Y Media Labs here in Redwood City. And um, Y Media Labs definitely had a very confident pitch for us. I felt really good about choosing them. I felt good about their team. And they did an amazing job. You know, they, they really supported us through that media storm. They were getting a lot of attention. Um, we literally had a finished product by the end of October. And with that global viral feedback, we changed the concept mm -hmm. and they were there with us through all of that and we have a CTO from San Francisco so with our CTO and my agency in Calgary we feel really supported and I think that one of our strengths now is on the tech side whereas before um, you know two women not in tech I didn't feel like we had a strong opportunity mm -hmm. until we found the right talent and the right people and thank God I'm in recruitment right so yes. I can recruit the right talent so you visited San Francisco before, right? You were here a couple times before and for a couple months last year. So when I raised all that money, it was time to get serious with Y Media Labs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I raised all the money in June and July, and then I moved to San Francisco in August. So the very beginning of August, I was here from August to October, and uh, we had weekly meetings with Y Media Labs to build the app. That was 2014? 2015. 15? Yeah. Yes. So just last, last year, just last fall. The media storm uh, started with the famous Washington Post article. It did. The it famous did. article. Yeah, the famous Washington Post article. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were misrepresented in that original article over seven times and they wouldn't fix it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was a bit of an integrity issue mm -hmm. there, but, you know, I'm grateful for the attention that it got. And it's just too bad that 
media used that as factual mm -hmm. instead of checking in with me. Did you give the interview actually to Washington Post back then? They must have seen us in the Canadian press mm -hmm. um, and then they called me, they contacted me and said, hey, can we talk about the People app? And of course I was excited. Uh -huh. It was the first American press and it was the Washington Post. I'm like, of course we could talk about the People app. But as soon as the interview was over, I kind of, you know, I was a bit naive at that point in terms of how media works and, you know, you think that they have your best interest in mind and you think that they're all excited and happy for you. But um, it wasn't until the end of the interview with Caitlin when I said, hey, Caitlin, would, would you actually use our app? Would you download our app? And when she said no, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> she was that straightforward to yeah. tell you no? Yeah, she said, mm. no, I wouldn't use your app. And then as soon as the article came out the next day, it all made sense. It all made sense. And I think what was difficult was we were called a bullying app, mm -hmm. which was so strange to myself, my co-founder, all of our shareholders. Because remember, we knew the entire concept. You know, why Media Labs and us and our shareholders fully were aware of the entire concept. We had it already built. So, you know, for th them to call us a bullying app didn't make any sense because we knew what we could and couldn't do on our mm -hmm. app. And so that was incredibly frustrating because we knew how many fail safes we put in and we knew that we were safer than most social media today. And what became ironic mm -hmm. is how I was bullied on every social media platform out there and you know that just i just proved my case of why we need the people app you need a safe place to manage your online reputation and current social media is no. not it and they were attacking you by saying that now you don't like it but how come are you building an app that may allow other people to be attacked because you couldn't play with the concept you couldn't actually go in our app and use it like you can today so i had a lot of empathy mm. for the fear, you know, and sometimes when there's a new innovative concept or disruption, fear, there's fear and then fear equals anger. So I understood that there was so much resistance, but what was so frustrating is I didn't release it to, to mm -hmm. prove to people that it's not a bullying mm -hmm. app. You can't hurt each other. You can't harm each other. And, and now today I can safely show that. And so that's what was, that's what was difficult. And how did you feel when the storm started? It was really intense, really fast. So imagine, and I'm not exaggerating, imagine like hundreds of emails a minute, phone calls every 10 minutes. My private information was given out, people are calling me, reporters are calling me, talk shows are calling me, random strangers are calling me. It was intense. And so I decided like after a day of trying to manage it myself, it didn't make sense. So I called my colleague Dustin in, in Calgary and I said, you need to catch the next flight out. I need your help. Mm -hmm. And so I had him come down, ride out that first week with me. And thank God he was so helpful. Like he kept me, you know, he fed me, <laughs> he like helped organize stuff. We, we started listening to all the feedback because we're, Remember, it's like it's coming in from all directions, LinkedIn, email, text, phone calls, like overwhelming calls to my office back in Calgary. Um, and we were able to, you know, book as many meetings as we could, but also understand where is this outrage coming from? Where is this misunderstanding coming from? And there were four main things that we got as feedback that were upsetting people. So we decided to make four major changes mm -hmm. during the media mm -hmm. storm. And, and those four changes, I think, are a good thing. So mm -hmm. um, currently, no one can add you to the app. You can deactivate your profile at any time. You have full control over what goes live on your profile. And there's no longer a five-star rating system mm -hmm. similar to Yelp. It's actually a people number, which is um, just the total number of recommendations you've published on your profile. So eventually, with future features, we'll be able to know how many total recommendations you've received, whether you've published them or not. So mm. yeah, this is important to integrity. So if I have 15 recommendations, but I've only published seven, what are those other seven about? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Many people are wondering, how are you actually going to control the credibility of the information that is being uploaded to people? So that 
those recommendations are real and um, right. you know as much to the point as possible. Totally fair. So what we're noticing so far with over 15,000 users is people are on their best behavior because they're not anonymous. When you're not anonymous, you, are, you have more integrity, you stick to the facts. And so if anybody receives a recommendation that they feel is inappropriate or violates our terms and conditions, they can block the user and report the user at any time. We are relying heavily on our users to report people that are being inappropriate. And we are gonna believe the person who reported more over the person who wrote the recommendation. Mm -hmm. The person who actually got recommended has more pull with us. And you know, we want you to have a good user experience on our app. Um, great question and you know, really safe. We've only had three people removed from the app with over 15,000 users. And this, this is because you're not anonymous. And so, you know, people are on their best behavior. We haven't even seen um, a lot of negative recommendations. People are being very positive and very friendly mm -hmm. and very uplifting, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we expected. Some fears may be that maybe people would open fake Facebook accounts. Will you have any way to to you know to discover this yeah this of course is not true so there's yeah so in all social media today this is the number one problem people creating fake accounts whether you're on twitter linkedin facebook youtube google like fake accounts in social media this is a big problem um, we take that very seriously and again we rely on our users to report other users um, with these fake accounts, here's the worst thing that can happen. They leave a recommendation for somebody that that person clearly doesn't know them because it's a fake name that nobody knows. So if somebody makes up a name, recommends me, I'm going to go, I don't even know that person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to report them and block them. So there's one experience that can happen. And as soon as they're reported and blocked, we can look into that. Um, another thing is, if you're not a real person on our app, there is no value for you because no one can find you because you're not real. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to search for somebody that doesn't exist. They're not going to be able to search for a fake name. So you're not going to receive recommendations, but if you're just going to give out recommendations and let's pretend you're going to be mean, you're going to get blocked and reported so fast you won't even last a day on our app. So we mm -hmm. take action every 24 hours. So one real person cannot have uh, multiple accounts on people? No, because you're tied to your cell phone number. Mm -hmm. So remember how I said that I can leave a recommendation for you if you're not on the app? The only reason why we ask for your cell phone number before I leave a recommendation for you is so that when you really do sign up, we're matching cell phone number to cell phone number so that all the recommendations for you, even if somebody else had the exact same name for you with a fake phone number, those recommendations won't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. You will truly only receive the recommendations that are truly for you because of your cell phone number. Mm -hmm. So this is how we authenticate. Yeah. I guess what current media are concerned about is that you said that no one could really add anyone to the app, but actually they can still make a review about everyone. <laughs> yes, yes. That, this is true. Yes, although this is true. it would not go live until that person That's creates exactly the profile. That's exactly right. So currently, you can search in our app, and let's say I search for you and you're not on the app. Um, there's two options. One, you're in my phone book, and my phone book will ask me if this is the Sylvia I'm looking for. The other option is um, it will allow me to enter in your cell phone number and your name and write the recommendation for you. And um, once, you, once I submit that recommendation, you're gonna receive a text from me, mm -hmm. and then you can decide to join the People app to see what I wrote and to see if you wanna publish what I wrote. So again, it's, we're not adding people, but we're still allowing them to be recommended in case you decide to join us. We will introduce new features to create a better user experience. We'd like to implement the Truth License, which is, you can upgrade the app in the future and see all of the recommendations that were never published on people's profile. Now, why would we do this? 
because we need more information to make decisions, better decisions about the people around us. And so with the truth license, you'll be able to take a deeper dive onto the back end to see all the recommendations that somebody wrote about others as well as the recommendations that the person received. And I think this is really important to transparency and integrity. So currently today, without the truth license, you can delete your recommendations that you receive. Mm -hmm. They're gone forever. Um, once we launch the truth license, you'll be able to take four actions. You can block the user who wrote the recommendation about you. You can report the user who wrote the recommendation about you. You can publish the recommendation you receive, or you can actually rebuttal to say your side of the story. And so this rebuttal would be only on the back end. It wouldn't be on the front page of your profile. So if you block that person, yes, the recommendation is there. If you report the person and we see that they've violated our terms and conditions or they were inappropriate in any way, we can permanently delete that recommendation so that nobody would see it. But when we actually did our research after we made those changes, there was a lot of complaints around well, if everyone has full control over what goes live on their profile, aren't they only going to post positive things? Yes, they probably will only post positive things. How do we get better information then? And that's why we have the truth license. People really wanted this. They wanted that full picture and they were willing to put up their character against the character of others to get the truth out, to make better decisions, to protect their greatest assets. Still coming back to the first media blow up, I imagine it must have been hard for you. Um, it was not nice. You were receiving a lot of hate, uh, including um, death threats. Did you actually have any moments that you would feel like, I can't handle this. I don't want this anymore and I quit. Right, I get this question a lot and I feel like I'm a really resilient person and in that resiliency what I found is there wasn't a point where I was like I don't want to do this or what are we doing or oh my gosh we're upsetting people. I was like this is going to fuel me even further to get my product out even faster to give them what they want to work harder to you know finally release the concept to prove that we're not what people thought we were. And so, yeah, it, it actually fueled my passion. I was able to work beyond all my mental and physical boundaries. And I think the greatest gift from all of that experience was I actually transcended most of my fears. When the whole world feel, when it feels like the whole world is against you, what fears are left? You know, the fear of people not liking you, that's one of people's greatest fears. Mm -hmm. And for me, once that happened, uh, once I became this villainized person, I, I really wasn't scared of anything after that. Mm -hmm. And so that was a gift. That was an amazing experience in, in that gift. Um, but of course, nobody deserves to be bullied. Nobody likes it. Um, and I have so much empathy for people that have been bullied because I am one of those people. Was there actually any pleasant moment during that media storm or was it just horrible right away? The first two days were really exciting, mm -hmm. right? Like we're having like Good Morning America call us, Discovery Channel, The Doctors, Dr. Phil, like all these great, The View, all these great people are calling us, competing for exclusivity and get us on the show. So it was very exciting. But, you know, fast forward four days later, death threats, constant harassment, random phone calls in the middle of the night from random weird people. Like, yeah. you know, it, it went from like, this is so cool to like, oh, like, like who are like these, these people? Like, get away right? yeah it exactly. felt it felt overwhelming yeah, yeah. and did you have to change your phone number i did yeah mm -hmm. i did have to change my phone number um and the address that was leaked it was also not your that's right phone. that's yeah. so horrible so yeah. i think for me that was the low was was about five days into the media storm um i believe it was around the fifth or the sixth yeah five days in um i had sold my house almost um six six months before that mm -hmm. and the address that was given out was that house that I sold 
And I was so worried about the guy who bought my house. And so I sent a police car mm. to that address to explain to him what was going on. We had police in San Francisco come to where I was to show them the death threats, to document everything. And it was, that, that was the low. Mm -hmm. um, that was the day where I realized that my view of the world of people predominantly being good, mm. that innocence, I think I lost a bit of innocence yeah. that day. That, 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 um, yeah, a bit of naive, mm -hmm. the world is predominantly good. I lost a bit of that that day. And this is why the launch date was postponed. Yeah, so right? we, were supposed to be, we were supposed to launch like November 9th. Mm -hmm. And then after that media storm in October, I, I went back to the drawing board and it was like we built the app twice. I went back to my team. I'm like, we have to redo the visual design. Did you cost it? Twice? It cost a lot of money. Yeah. yeah, and and we did that out of the responsibility to the public telling us what they wanted. Why would we launch something that they say they don't like these four things about it when we could just spend more money and give them what they want? Mm -hmm. And so we actually spent the next like November, December, January changing the app mm -hmm. and rebuilding it. What's ironic though, is the original concept would have never been approved by Apple as is. So there are some features in the original concept that go against Apple's terms and conditions. And so I'm glad that we changed the app because mm -hmm. even though we were still rejected by Apple twice, once in January and once in February, mm -hmm. we would have never gotten through with the old concept. And this is also where the delay into March went. Through. Yes, so we we were all ready. We submitted on January 14th. I'm like, yes, we're gonna make our January launch deadline. <laughs> Apple's gonna take five to 15 days to approve the app. They literally rejected us. We submitted January 14th. They rejected us January 15th. You know, Apple received a lot of flack from people that didn't want our product to go live. They were like petitions against it. Exactly, with over 10,000 <laughs> signatures. I mean, but, but Apple, I'm grateful because Apple took the time to understand us and ask for minor changes, um, which ultimately made a better product. So even the products we had in January became better with the two Apple rejections. So we submitted January 14th, rejected January 15th, submitted uh, February, I think it was February 5th, and we were rejected um, towards the end of February. Mm. And so it was just really frustrating. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know what? There's a conspiracy here, like Apple's gonna like try and take us out. Mm. But no, they were great. There's this guy named Bill from Apple. I like to call him Bill from uh -huh. Apple. And uh, kind of a funny story. Um, so I called Bill after we submitted for the third time to get approved. And I'm like, hey, Bill, we're ready. Like, check it out, expedite the review process, see where we're at. And he's like, I, uh, I'm blocked by your app. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? Like, how are you blocked by my app? Well, he says, I don't know. It just says contact you guys because you've been blocked. And I thought, well, that's weird. I'm like, what's your name? And he said, I'm Fly Flyerson. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we actually blocked you in the beta test because you were inappropriate to somebody that we know oh. here in Calgary and she reported you and like we promised in our terms and conditions, you would get removed from the app. So we actually blocked Apple Reviewer. not knowing yeah. it was Apple. <laughs> so it's really funny, like okay. it's like so but, ironic. Right, but then you proved. They were proud, they, yeah. were, they he, he actually said like, I'm glad you did what you said you were gonna do, but yeah. now you need to unblock us so that we yeah. can test your app. So, right, but that's probably also what he did it for. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he wanted to see how yeah. serious we were. Mm -hmm. And even in beta, mm -hmm. we made sure we protected our 500 users in beta. Like, mm -hmm. we, we took it very seriously. So, kind of a funny story that we blocked Apple <laughs> after they rejected us. So, I was like, just by chance, they were misbehaving in our app. So. so, with your launch date, you were so sure it's going to be March 7th because you were approved already and you were waiting to re release it? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. we chose, like, as soon as Apple approved us, they actually approved us at the end of February. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I wanted, like, a good week mm -hmm. to really prepare, prepare the media 
prepare our company, make sure that all the tech supports there, yeah. make sure that as soon as we hit the button, w yeah. we're fully ready. Yeah, right? well, so, with this all this attention, I yeah. could imagine you would want that. The yeah. world is watching, like we can't <laughs> screw up the launch, right? So um, we were lucky, we actually got to put up a, an ad in Times Square, which I yes, think was the I highlight. Yes, I to ask you about this. Yeah, very how? affordable, by the way. People think it's very expensive, but it's very affordable. So how did you find your ways? Into yeah, so, um, so we have something called Canada Newswire. And with Newswire, you can actually publish a, um, a press release. And um, so we chose to publish our press release for the North America market. And included in that press release, we were able to advertise our image on Times Square. So it was, it was really affordable. We were able to put up our image in Times Square um, and do the press release all at the same time, and it just went live. Mm. Yeah, so it was a really so cool awesome. experience. Really so, cool experience. In the current media storm, I feel like TechCrunch was most aggressive on you, and I would say that it was even more negative than the original Washington Post article, where TechCrunch says that you are not really implementing the changes that you are saying you are, because you are keeping everything on the server, you, in your terms and conditions you are um, keeping the right to do whatever you want with the data, and they still are kind of afraid of uh, what may happen to this. Whereas I think that in the current terms and conditions of most mobile apps, it yeah. says yes, that they it do does. whatever they want with all the data that, that is, is exactly created. right. It's yeah, this nothing is, new. This is standard. This is standard yeah. because you want to keep it in case you want to protect yourself too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate anybody's opinion on our concept, but what I think is more important than the noise out there or the opinions are the actual people using the app and we're listening to our users and the app will become what mm -hmm. those users want. And you know, when it comes to what we did or didn't do, we actually gave the world what they said they wanted. And there's nothing more I could give at this point. So if people still don't like people, mm -hmm. I don't really care because I did my best and I gave those four major changes and they are currently active in our app. And so any changes after that will be based on what the users want. And so, you know, if TechCrunch or anybody else is doubtful, um, those are just their opinions. They're probably not even testing the app. They're probably not even using it. And no, um, no, I'm not listening not, yeah. to the noise. I'm listening to our users. And so I can appreciate everybody has an opinion. Um, but I'm really proud of the product that we've made. And I'm proud of where we came from. Who we are today as a company is so much stronger than if we launched last November. This time, uh, the media storm is huge. It's again, yeah. you know... A little uh, bit controversial. Yeah, controversial, but also sure. it's like all over media now, right. too, right? Which, right. Is, which is helpful for downloads, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I've never complained about that. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there's nothing worse than launching a product and no one cares. How about your feelings this time? Is there more positivity towards you? Um, how do you feel when it comes to this second media storm? It's a totally different experience. Lots of positive feedback, um, lots of excitement, lots of questions on how it works. Um, and people are kinder. Um, I, I'm getting a lot more um, positive feedback and there's still some fearful people that are still misunderstanding the concept, but I can guarantee you they're not mm -hmm. actually using our app. Mm -hmm. Right now there is 1.5 star review on Apple Store. How do you feel about that and do you have a plan what to do about this? Yeah, so my... <laughs> it's so funny. Um, it's kind of ironic, right? Because most of those reviews are fake, right? These are people that haven't even tried the app. They're they, just scared. They had to download it. Right? right, but they didn't necessarily mm -hmm. use it. They just downloaded it to leave the review, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's disappointing. But um, I'm really sure about what we're doing and who we are and um, and if people downloaded the app and still claim that it's not safe or it's a bullying app, they obviously didn't spend time on it. 
Um, if we were able to launch our product without the media attention that we had, I'm not so sure we would have the same star rating. So I think these are our haters getting on there and trying to just bring us down. Yeah. Because they're constantly tweeting about mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. These are these are just troublemakers. They just tr they just want to hurt us, mm -hmm. and um, that's okay because in the end, we'll just keep proving it to our real users, not the phantom users that quickly downloaded it just to leave us a fake review. So yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. Overall, Julia, do you think that this whole media attention worked for the better or worse for your company? Yeah, so I guess we'll never know. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is from the response that we've gotten for downloads and um, the attention that we've gotten, I really don't think that we would be where we are today with investors and with our company and the amount of people in it if we hadn't gotten that media attention. I just don't think anybody would have cared as much. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my biggest fear. I'm a marketer at heart. Like I was like, oh God, what if we launch this product and no one cares? But as soon as I talked about the concept, because we kept the concept completely radio silent, completely under the radar for a year and a half. Anybody that heard about our concept was signing NDAs. So when we released the concept verbally to the press, you can imagine it was hugely shocking, the reaction that we got, um, but very rewarding because it was like doing the world's largest beta test without beta exactly, testing. Yeah. And now we are who we are as a company mm -hmm. because of that entire experience. So I don't regret it. Yeah. I think it's been really great. Julia, do you plan to spend more time in San Francisco? What are your plans for the next year and the next couple of years? Um, so, we're currently looking for a VC or a fund or an angel investor to take us to that next level. I mean, there's only so much I'm going to be able to do with the money that I've raised and you know the bootstrapping that we've done. So once we find the right VC or fund or angel investor for us, my dream would be to build the company in San Francisco or San Diego. Um, I think that would be really amazing. And because I'm a dual citizen, that won't be difficult for me. Um, my goal is to raise $5 million by May, and um, that would allow me to relocate. So that's, that's my goal. Well, I guess we'll find out. Like, if I'm here in, in the summer, then, you know, yeah. things went according to plan. Yeah. So. And, and I usually hit my goals. Julia, thank you so much for speaking with me today. To anyone who would like to try out people, they can easily find it on App Store, and soon it will be available on Android as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.